life on Earth began evolving around four billion years ago. And we tend to assume that we humans are the pinnacle of that evolution, natural rulers of the planet. But what if we had been completely wiped out at the very start of our evolutionary journey? This may sound like science fiction, but scientists across the globe now think this nearly happened. Half a billion years ago, way before there were any humans, apes, or even dinosaurs, our earliest ancestors fought a battle for survival in an alien world. Only now can we see how close we came to losing that war. Defeat would have changed the course of evolution forever and filled the Earth with armies of creatures far beyond our worst nightmares. Half a billion years ago, on the edge of the Milky Way, stood a tiny planet of barren rock. Its surface scorched by the sun's radiation, scoured by 100 mile an hour winds. The land was lifeless. But there was more than just sand and rock on this planet. There were oceans, and in those oceans lay another hidden world. A world teeming with strange, alien-looking life. Aliens like these armor-plated megabugs swarmed in shoals of a thousand at a time, sifting the nutrient-rich water for food. They caught their prey with grasping limbs, grinding it up in machine-like pincer jaws. The warm waters were alive with clouds of scavengers. 150 feet down on the sea floor was where most creatures lived among forests of sponges. Scuttling bottom feeders went in search of a mating partner while trying to avoid becoming someone else's lunch. Everything here was wary of intruders and each had its own way of dealing with threats. Above cruised packs of opportunist hunters ready to use their whipped tentacles on the unwary. This pin cushion on legs used its spines to prevent attack from above but there were dangers in the strangest places and the weirdest forms. This five-eyed paddled steamer carried a vicious mouth at the end of an elephant-like trunk, a search and destroy feeder all in one. These freakish creatures may seem very alien, yet they are not sci-fi inventions, and this is not an alien planet. This is planet Earth, half a billion years ago. And this period of Earth's history, the Cambrian era, saw the evolution of the world's first complex animals. Amazingly, they appeared almost overnight in a sudden burst of evolution, what scientists have labeled the Cambrian explosion. Science has long tried to explain the reasons why this explosion happened. But Dr. Simon Brady from the University of Bristol now believes he may have the answer. For Simon, the Cambrian explosion is the single most important biological event in the history of planet Earth. He believes that whatever caused that explosion set life on Earth on an irreversible course. It is a course he intends to follow in order to help answer the ultimate question, how did we get here? I've just walked 350 meters down this beach and 
What that represents is literally walking through time. Every step I take is 10 million years of life on Earth. Now, way back there, 350 metres away, we have the earliest evidence of life on Earth. But for 85% of the time, it's basically been slime, simple bacteria. It's only about 50 metres back down my trail that we actually see the appearance of complex, multicellular animals. The turning point, this major transition in the complexity of life, is the Cambrian explosion. This line that I've just drawn in the sand represents the boundary between the pre-Cambrian world, where life was basically slime, and the Cambrian, and the development and rise of these complex animals. So what caused this sudden revolution? One of the most important driving features of the Cambrian explosion was that organisms were eating each other for the first time. It was predation, and that would change the course of evolution for the next 540 million years. This was the start of the world's first arms race, a race for domination of the Earth among its major groups of animals. The rules of kill or be killed forced everything to evolve the best body form it could for attack, defense, or escape. As in any arms race, certain groups would come to dominate. Ultimately, three would emerge from the pack as front runners. The dominant group today, which includes us, are the vertebrates, defined by an internal skeleton of bones and a spinal cord. Things we share with all other vertebrates like fish, reptiles, birds, and our fellow mammals. The other main competitors were these, the arthropods, all those creatures with a hard external skeleton and jointed limbs, like insects, spiders, as well as lobsters and crabs all the Earth's bugs. And finally, there are the mollusks, the snail family, which also includes squid and octopus, soft-bodied creatures with or without a shell. Standing here in the 21st century, the notion that these creatures ever competed with us for mastery of the Earth seems ludicrous. But new evidence reveals that we were almost wiped from the face of the Earth by a bunch of bugs and snails. The scientific quest to understand the battle for this primeval world is one of the greatest detective stories in evolutionary biology. Traveling back in time to the very first life on Earth has only been possible because of a remarkable discovery made in one of the most popular mountain ranges on Earth. To reach the site of that discovery means a tough, day-long hike to the heart of the Canadian Rockies. In the course of a half a billion years, the Cambrian seabed has become a mountaintop, and its inhabitants lie here, buried as a collection of fossils called the Burgess Shale. For Des Collins at the Royal Ontario Museum, these fossils represent the biologist's ultimate dream, a chance to see physical evidence for the origins of all species. Half a billion years ago, these mountains were nothing more than mud at the bottom of the sea. Since that time, the seafloor has been transformed into a compacted, hardened rock called shale. Each layer is a slice of that first living world, frozen in time. When we think of fossils, we think of dinosaurs. Yet for Des, these fossils are infinitely more important. They are five times older, and every animal that ever walked the earth, swam in the sea, or flew in the air, has its origins here. The Burgess Shell fossils re represent the beginning of everything, right? That this is our first good look at animal life soon after it evolved. 
Uh, and that's because of the exquisite preservation of these things. So what it sh it's showing you what life was like uh, when it was first evolved, and it's showing you the complete range of life at that particular time. And that's the life from which everything else has since evolved. You see the slab, Des? Yeah. Wow, Des's years of experience mean that he can make sense of fossils that to most people look like shadows in the rock. Mm -hmm. Look at this guy here, you can see the, the tail sticking out of that one. These are the armored bugs, Canadaspis, that once filled the Cambrian oceans, believed to be the ancestor of many modern insects. This is Hallucigenia, a creature so weird it was inspired by the term hallucination, yet it's the ancestor of many kinds of worm. This five-eyed freak is Apabinia, another bug ancestor. Without this unique collection of fossils, scientists would still be in the dark about the true origins of every animal species on Earth. And that includes us. Perhaps the most important find here in the Burgess Shale is a tiny sliver of fossilized flesh called Pekaya. Amazingly, it is this frail-looking specimen which has been identified as our first, most distant ancestor. This is Pekaya. It's about uh, two to three centimeters long. It has along the back here this cord-like structure, which is related to our spinal cord in here. And the descendants of this then developed a backbone uh, and a bony skeleton. And of course, the first ones uh, that, were, that were successful were the fishes. And then from the fishes evolved the, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals and birds, and of course, ultimately us. We're the, just the latest development of this whole succession of evolutionary changes which began with this little guy here, Bakaya, here in the Burgess Shale. And of course, if this thing hadn't survived, then we wouldn't be around anyway. So it's very important to us. It has taken half a billion years for us to evolve from this humble creature, an uninterrupted journey of evolution, but a journey fraught with danger. Now for the first time, scientists are realizing how unlikely it was that we would even make it past the first bend in the evolutionary race. We always have the advantage of looking back in retrospect. We know what ultimately happened. So if you then trace it back and say, okay, could you predict that what happened would happen? Well, there's, there's no way. Who would pick this little wormy thing? You would never pick Pakaya if you were a bookmaker. This guy's a, a thousand to one odds, you know, and you throw on your way the money if you, if you, if you, if you could bet on it. Although Pakaya had the beginnings of a spinal cord, as yet, he had no bony skeleton, no teeth or claws. He was utterly defenseless. One of the great mysteries of the Burgess Shale is how Pekaya managed to survive in a hostile world. Because for the first time, scientists are able to picture quite how hostile it was. Here at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, all the fossils collected in recent years from the Burgess Shale have been brought for analysis. At last count, they had 120,000 specimens covering 200 species, each one preserved in incredible detail. Among the countless fossil fragments, they found compelling evidence for the first victims of a giant serial killer which stalked the Cambrian seas a monster predator capable of making mincemeat of anything. Des Collins has turned forensic scientist, examining the body of a typical victim. A, a, a fairly large arthropod here called Helmetia. This one would have been fairly flat. Uh, and it probably, it's got two big eyes at the front, so it was probably buried with the eyes sticking up sort of like a place, a fish today. Uh, and, but then we find specimens with great big bites. There's the one here with a huge bite taken out of it. And this is associated with, uh, this is associated with giant predators. Uh, there's the shape, there's the eyes in the middle, and there's a big bite taken right out of the, of the carapace of this thing. So there's only a little bit of it left in here. So this obviously was a, a lethal bite on this animal. So it must have been good to eat. The only clues to the killer's identity were a set of circular jaws 
and several pairs of disembodied claws. But for years, they had no idea what they belonged to. Then in the early 90s, Des led a party to the Burgess Shale, which uncovered the first complete specimen. We all took a picture of us all sitting together, just with the fossils, so we all sort of grouped around this, and it was just to sort of see it, because it, was, because it showed so much that we hadn't seen before. And the guys had been working there all, you know, for two months, and we had bits and pieces, and then suddenly, complete one. They could finally build a complete profile of the serial killer. A predator they called Anomalocaris, the T-Rex of the Burgess Shale. It swam around with his head pulled back in, his claws retracted, just cruising around. Because these two big eyes on stalks would see its prey, would dive in. And that's just as it got, they would unroll the claws, reach out and grab, and then, and then tear the thing to pieces. For a top predator, survival meant constant hunting. And anything, however big or small, was fair game. Once spotted in the open, the chances of escape for this solitary Olenoides were zero. Overwhelming size and power put a swift end to the chase. And the hard jaws and vice-like claws would make short work of dismembering the armored bug. Des has found startling evidence to show quite how big these monsters could get. We have this specimen here, and you can see the, uh, the huge claws of these are almost a foot long. So you're talking about animals probably up to four or five feet, four or five feet long. So it's much bigger than everything else in the Burgess Shale. This was the, the major predatory group in the Cambrian period half, half a billion years ago, the first major predatory group on Earth. Hunting in the oceans today follows the same strategies invented half a billion years ago by these animals. Stalking, evasion, camouflage, and surprise attack all started here. And the pioneers all belong to one group. From the watching five-eyed scavengers like Apabinia to the monster predators like Anomalocaris, right down to the Olenoides scurrying about on the sea floor. The oceans at this time were dominated by one group of animals. The arthropods, the megabugs. As the battle lines were drawn in the war for world domination, the bugs were well ahead. At this time, there was one group who hadn't even entered the battlefield, the mollusks. The snails are nowhere. In the Burgess Shale, they look like this, a bunch of barnacles that hardly anyone could be bothered to eat. And where were we? We were well behind the bugs and in serious danger of extinction. In a world filled with giant predators, Pekaya was the perfect prey. Fossils of Pekaya are extremely rare in the Burgess Shale, less than a tenth of one percent of the total, a dangerously low presence. It is possible for an entire species to be hunted to extinction. You only have to think of the dodo. At the very least, it could point to Bakaya being on the endangered list. How did he avoid being eaten into extinction? Dez's colleague Jean-Bernard Caron believes that what he lacked in physical strength, he may have made up for with strategy. Picaya qui n'a pas de, uh, de défense, uh... Pikaya has no physical defenses. He has no hard shell, no spines like most of the animals in the Burgess Shale. But he may have developed a survival strategy. 
This strategy involved burying himself in the mud, but keeping a lookout. I think in this way he could have avoided being spotted by any of the giant predators. This might have kept him from the attentions of Anomalocaris, who mainly hunted above the sea floor. Yet Anomalocaris was not the only beast in the sea. He was part of a megabug menagerie called the Dinocarids. Like the dinosaurs, these monsters had a lot of successful variations on the killing theme. And there may even have been a Dinocarid capable of digging up every Pacaya hiding in the sea floor. Des Collins and his assistant, Kevin Goslin, are taking a trip to a remote plateau high in the Rockies in search of this elusive predator. So far, they have found only jaws and claws, no complete body. But the evidence points to a monster as big as Anomalocaris and with a definite taste for the lowlife. If something was going to find Pacaya in his hiding place, the fossils suggest this mysterious predator could have done it. We've been here on, on previous trips, and on that we found these claws and the jaws of a new Dinocarid. We, uh, we know it's new because the, the claws them, themselves have these long, thin spines running from them. So their understanding of this is that these would work together. And the only reason I can see for something like that is that they use them to rake through, this, through the mud on the bottom. So I would say this animal uh, was probably feeding on soft-bodied forms rather than feeding on something with a hard exoskeleton on it. Rather than chase other hard-cased megabugs, this guy specifically went after softer targets in the seabed, like buried pacayas. The lack of pacaya in the fossils might be explained by some of them being in the guts of this new predator. When they find a complete specimen, there may be traces in its stomach that will confirm this one way or the other. The fact that we are here means that Pacaya must have hung on somehow. And they have unearthed extraordinary evidence that could suggest how it did this by being remarkably resourceful. These are the fossilized babies of the megabug Leoncoilia. It's thought that to avoid being eaten by predators or even by their own parents, the babies would migrate away from the main community to grow up in a nursery a safe haven that Pacaya could exploit. Here, Pacaya fossils were found in the greatest numbers. When Jean Bernard compared the rock bearing these fossils to those of Pacaya, they were a perfect match. It seems the fossils we found in the Burgess show that Pacaya was more common in areas where we don't find the big predators. One theory is that Pacaya was able to hide himself away in these groups of baby arthropods. It was perhaps a more subtle form of self-preservation. Pekaya could certainly live a protected existence here. And it may have been very successful because we do find lots of Pekaya in these nurseries. Somehow, Pekaya was able to hang on long enough to evolve further. But buried in mud or hiding with babies, he was a fugitive in his own world, miles behind the leaders in the arms race. Who would ever have thought Pacaya was going to become the dominant group later on, including in the, the vertebrates? And of course, there's, there's, there's no, no chance at all. If you were, if you were a Dinocarid in the Cambrian, you, you had it all, you know, and would presume that you were going to have it forever, right? And no reason to think otherwise. You were much better than anything came before, and there's nothing around at present which, which can compete with you. This was the world of the Dinocarids. When the arthropods ruled the seas, 
in a 30 million year reign of terror. Meanwhile, the vertebrates were barely hanging on by the skin of the teeth they didn't even have yet. The future really looks quite bleak for the vertebrates. You would probably anticipate that this was going to be an arthropod dominated world. By the end of the Cambrian era, 490 million years ago, Pacaya was extinct, but he'd done his job and passed on his genes to his descendants. But would they evolve fast enough to stay in the race? In order to be able to compete with the arthropods, with the vertebrates, they're going to have to fight back. They're going to need adaptations like teeth, claws, ways of catching other organisms more effectively. They're going to need to get larger. That's exactly what happens. The arms race goes nuclear. Though our ancestors were on the run and the threat of extinction was just around the corner, sooner or later, they were destined to fight back. And the reign of the bugs would eventually give way. But it wasn't our family, the vertebrates, who next rose to power. There was a new terror lurking in the seas. The age of the super snails was about to begin. Having narrowly avoided annihilation at the hands of the megabugs, it was the turn of the super snails to put us under sentence of death. The second great battle would prove to be the toughest fight of our evolutionary lives. The new campaign began 440 million years ago. The evidence for it is buried here in South Africa, in a layer of rock that starts at the top of Cape Town's Table Mountain and stretches 100 miles inland. A major fossil bed was unearthed here, called the Sum Shale. And just like the Burgess Shale 80 million years previously, it held a complete snapshot of life on Earth. Simon Brady has come to South Africa to see the evidence for the next stage in the evolutionary arms race. He is joined by geologist Hannes Tron, who made the single most important discovery here. Teeth, some of the earliest on Earth, our first weapons in the war for world domination. They belong to an animal called a conodont, a descendant of Bacaya. At 15 inches, the conodonts were 10 times bigger than their feeble ancestor. And with their new armory, they could finally stand up to their old enemy, the arthropods. It seemed the evolutionary tables had turned, or had they? Because this bug wasn't killed by a conodont. The conodonts don't represent actual true predators, they're scavengers, so they, they feed on dead carcasses of animals which are just littering around in the environment. So the vertebrates haven't made that breakthrough yet in the evolutionary arms race of becoming predators. So if we weren't doing the killing, who was? There was a new alien presence in the seas. The evidence came in the form of these strange conical shells. Three times bigger than a conodont, they are the remains of an animal called a nautiloid, the earliest ancestor of the modern squid. In a world of conventional warfare, this was the first weapon of mass destruction. This is a modern squid, highly intelligent and ruthless. It is using the same killing techniques pioneered by its ancestors. Hidden inside the powerful arms, a rasping beak that could make mincemeat of any prey. conflict between the nautiloids and the conodonts, it was no contest. Victory went to the new stealth weapon, the jet-powered torpedo of the deep.
and just when things were starting to look up. 80 million years of evolution since the Burgess Shale had put us in a position to overtake the bugs, only to find that we'd been overtaken by the snails. These super snails had not only joined the arms race, they'd gone straight into the lead. And the fossil record shows that they were set to stay on top for another 50 million years. If we were ever going to rise to dominance, something would have to break the super snail's grip on power. Four hundred and forty million years ago, suddenly, and quite literally out of the blue, we got lucky. It's ironic, but the thing that ultimately came to save us nearly killed us in the process. A vast and overwhelming natural disaster struck the Earth. Just a few miles from the Sum Shale, Hannes Tron has taken Simon to see a section of bare rock which looks like a plowed field. But it's evidence, Hannes believes, for a global catastrophe, a mega ice age. We have the glacial floor here. Some agent must have created these deep indentations, gouges and striations. So in the process of moving across this partly consolidated, soft sort of sediment still, it made scratches and it made hollows and it pushed all sorts of rocks and pieces across it. Now the only agency by which all these things come together is that it must have been in a glacial setting. The Ice Age was so intense, it covered most of the planet with a solid sheet of death half a mile thick. It was an agonizing way to die, slow and gradual at first as the temperature started to drop. The ice built up over more and more of the ocean surface, and darkness descended on the world below. Without sunlight, the plants died, the food chain was broken, starvation set in. And when the big thaw came, things got even worse. Melting fresh water polluted the sea, poisoning the marine animals. It was a mass extinction, like the apocalypse that removed the dinosaurs, but many times bigger. A quarter of all life died in this icy holocaust. Our survival hung in the balance. Any mass extinction can be thought of as when life was on a knife edge. It's a critical moment where the course of evolution could be changed and depending on how organisms cope with that mass extinction, how they're able to adapt and diversify after that extinction will drive the course of subsequent evolution for 50, 100 million years. The evolutionary arms race was turned on its head. The big losers were the mollusks. 80% of nautiloids disappeared, while the bugs got off lightly. And we just about hung on. It raises a critical question. If a global catastrophe hits every animal on Earth, why do some survive when most perish? How did we manage to escape the big freeze? The answer could lie here, in an ancient forest near Cape Town. There's a piece of living evidence that may help explain how we survived this natural disaster. In the Newlands Forest lives a creature that has survived every mass extinction on Earth. It has come through nearly 500 million years of existence, barely unchanged. It is a surviving remnant of the Burgess Shale, a living fossil. Simon has called on the help of bug expert Mike Picker to track down this elusive creature called Peripetus. He knows they keep a very low profile, hiding away in dark, damp corners like rotting logs, and only coming out to feed at night. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm gonna go one. Oh wow. Here we go. Nice big one as well. Now, as you can see, it's a completely rotting log. Peripetus is the ultimate survivor. It is absolutely amazing that these things are so simple and yet, in evolutionary terms, so effective. Simon believes they've survived so long because they were small and could hide in protected spaces, less affected by a changing environment. But their big advantage was being at the bottom of the food chain. Back at the time of the Sum Shale, the nautiloids were the big specialist predators at the very top of the food chain. When the world changed, their high protein food supply dried up. Whenever you have a large predatory animal, like the dinosaurs, they can become over-specialized so that when there is a catastrophe and there is a great upheaval in the sort of ecological balance, it's usually those over-specialized creatures which go first. Um, it's these generalist type of organisms which tend to be much better at coping with these types of uh, overall ecological shifts. At the critical moment when the Ice Age struck, we too were near the bottom of the food chain, a scavenger, a nobody like the humble Peripetus. But as the world changed, our weakness became our strength and saw us through the hard times. In the evolutionary arms race, the Ice Age mass extinction was a lucky break. The mollusks happened to be at the top of the pile when it collapsed. The effect was to remove them from the battlefield. But if we thought the field was open to us, we were in for a big surprise. With the super snails gone, an old adversary had risen again. The mega bugs were back. In the vaults of the Royal Ontario Museum lies evidence of a monster that terrorized the oceans. For Des Collins, this is one of the most important specimens in the building, a 420 million year old sea scorpion. A giant arthropod predator, longer than a man is tall, with eight inch serrated pincers capable of cutting through a human arm. Okay, let's get the head. <clears throat> Des believes this beast is a throwback to the predators of the Burgess Shale. After all this time, a hundred million years they've been sort of there biding their time and now suddenly they're back. And of course, th this is of course quite similar to, to uh, the Anomalocaris in the sense it's got claws and jaws. So they, it, it's, they're still using the same way of, 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 of attacking and, and, and tearing up its prey. Exactly the way that uh, Anomalocaris did. The evolutionary tables had turned full circle. The sea scorpions have developed of these gigantic sizes, and the arthropods have come back as the one, and they're contending, and they're in the, in the form of this guy would have, would, would have nothing would, would attack something like this. The bugs were once more king of the seas, and at this moment in time, 400 million years ago, it looked like they were bound to win the war. Yet they would soon be defeated for good and we would be victorious at last. But why? Because within every vertebrate lies a secret weapon, and every arthropod has a major hidden flaw. But they would only come to light in the final evolutionary battle, fought on a new battlefield, the land. Ironically, the seeds of our triumph and the arthropods' downfall were planted in the oceans half a billion years ago at the time of the Burgess Shale. Eager at that time to expand their empire and being the only group able to do it, the bugs took an inevitable but fatal step. While the arms race raged in the oceans, the first bug walked onto land just one small step, it was a giant leap for bug kind. 
But the new world that greeted them was a tough place to live, scoured by winds and burnt to a crisp by the sun. And what looked like a brave venture turned out to be the biggest mistake of their evolutionary lives. There are no fossils of these first pioneers, but Simon Brady wants to know what they looked like, how such a step was possible, and why it went so badly wrong. He has turned to modern computer graphics to unlock the secrets of bug body design. What we need to do in order to turn this into an insect is we need to get rid of these gills. The reason why the arthropods were the first to get onto land is because they had so many good pre-adaptations. They had a skeleton on the outside of their body which was like a spacesuit. It would shield them from the, the harsh environment of what life was like on land 500 million years ago. So they could uh, maintain all their body fluids um, and they, it also provided them with mechanical support in order that they could be able to move around. So that's 200%. Creatures like so. these were the first ever insects, destined to fill the earth with billions of descendants. But their dominance of the land would be short-lived, because they had a design fault. Without the buoyancy of water to support them, their spacesuit body armor was just too heavy. It stopped them growing more than three feet tall. It's quite ironic that this spacesuit, which allowed them to colonize land much earlier, was ultimately limiting their type of uh, diversification and size that they could attain. For 130 million years, it didn't matter. There was no competition. But during that time, the Earth had changed. The first plants appeared, building up the planet's ozone layer. In this cooler world with its natural sunblock, Creatures no longer needed a spacesuit to survive. 370 million years ago, the first vertebrates left the seas and came onto land. They brought with them a secret weapon that would change the balance of power forever. That weapon was our internal skeleton, a simple but highly effective framework. It allowed us to build bodies of overwhelming size and power we could totally outgrow our armor-bound bug competitors. And in the arms race, more than anywhere, size mattered. For the bugs, there was nowhere to go but down, which meant downsizing. The insects, millipedes, spiders, and lobsters all went through a process of miniaturization. For those who refuse to follow, the end of the line lies here, in the remote Cedarburg Mountains of South Africa. Two years ago, Cape Town geologist John Almond unearthed a bizarre set of footprints on one of these giant shale boulders. Simon Brady has come to see the evidence. Wow, that is amazing. Now, there she is very clear sets of impressions. The John believes side, these yeah. prints were left by the largest bug that ever Animal walked the earth 270 million years ago. But sadly, mm. we've lost the right-hand margin. Now what we guess is if we had the complete foot impressions on this side, this distance there would be something like a meter. The trackway suggests the largest bug that ever lived was 10 feet long by 3 feet wide. But these footsteps also show that this freak was an evolutionary dead end, scratching out a living on a lake bed. On land, the reign of the megabugs had already ended. The only way in which these giant arthropods are clinging on to existence is in these specialized types of habitats where they're not competing with the vertebrates. So it's game over for the arthropods in terms of this race for dominance of the planet. This left all the big spaces on Earth to their giant competitors. By 250 million years ago, the third and final battle in the evolutionary arms race was over. Victorious, Pacaya's descendants would dominate the Earth. First, the great reptiles, the dinosaurs would rule. 
then came the mammals, and finally, of course, us. Yet the fossil record shows, beyond a doubt, the world we have built had humble and very fragile origins. Twice, before we had even left the seas, we came close to annihilation. 400 million years ago, we fell prey to the giant mollusks. But it was the arthropods, the megabugs, who came closest to wiping us out, right at the very start of the arms race. Back then, we were very few and very weak. If they were ever going to rid the world of the vertebrates, this was their best chance. And Simon Brady thinks they just might have done it. It's quite possible that the arthropods could have just been that little bit more effective in their predatory strategies and their behavior, or the vertebrates maybe weren't quite so clever at being able to hide away from the arthropods. If those things happened, then the arthropods would have been able to eradicate the vertebrates. If they had, how different the world would be. It would be a world without any vertebrate, a world without humans. It would be a world ruled by a master race of super-evolved bugs. The arthropods would have free reign. They could maintain their large body size. They could basically not compete with any other type of organism. They would be the dominant giant form on this planet now. But what would they look like? Simon's final goal is to reconstruct that giant bug. In the ultimate biological experiment, he will apply the same evolutionary forces that produced us to create a new life form, an alien on Earth. He's starting with a bug that first appeared 300 million years ago, an aggressive, highly organized predator, the common wasp. We're gonna to need to scale it up. Is that possible? Though limited by its body armor, Simon believes that with a bit of added support, a six-legged bug could stand as big as a wolf. Add his body back up. Add the original body. Now evolution would take it in the same direction as the human race. It would stand upright. The advantages of height and reach would change its body shape, allowing it to stand as tall as a man. And freeing up the forearms would allow the evolution of a hand. Three, three things coming together in the form of a right. triangle. Yeah. So if you can elongate the head slightly, yeah. like um, the alien in the film, okay, yeah. series of films. And with a large head, Simon's creature is ready to take the final evolutionary leap. This may have given the organism the possibility to evolve a larger brain. So it's reasonable to expect that it also would have been evolving intelligence. Wow. Wouldn't like to meet him on a dark night. <laughs> Simon has imagined a future evolution for the giant predatory bugs that first appeared half a billion years ago. In this scenario, they reclaim a planet we have always believed was ours by right. But as the bugs might tell us, just when you think you're in charge, Evolution likes to remind you, you're not. As you can see, it's a completely rotting log. Peripetus is the ultimate survivor. It is absolutely amazing that these things are so simple and yet, in evolutionary terms, so effective. Simon believes they've survived so long because they were small and could hide in protected spaces, less affected by a changing environment. 
but their big advantage was being at the bottom of the food chain. Back at the time of the Sum Shale, the nautiloids were the big specialist predators at the very top of the food chain. When the world changed, their high protein food supply dried up. Whenever you have a large predatory animal, like the dinosaurs, they can become over-specialized so that when there is a catastrophe and there is a great upheaval in the sort of ecological balance, it's usually those over-specialized creatures which go first. Um, it's these generalist type of organisms which tend to be much better at coping with these types of uh, overall ecological shifts. At the critical moment when the Ice Age struck, we too were near the bottom of the food chain, a scavenger, a nobody like the humble Peripetus. Half a billion years ago, on the edge of the Milky Way, stood a tiny planet of barren rock. Its surface scorched by the sun's radiation, scoured by hundred mile an hour winds. The land was lifeless. But there was more than just sand and rock on this planet. There were oceans, and in those oceans lay another hidden world. A world teeming with strange, alien-looking life. Aliens like these armor-plated megabugs swarmed in shoals of a thousand at a time, sifting the nutrient-rich water for food. They caught their prey with grasping limbs, grinding it up in machine-like pincer jaws. The warm waters were alive with clouds of scavengers, 150 feet down on the sea floor was where most creatures lived among forests of sponges. Only to find that we'd been overtaken by the snails. These super snails had not only joined the arms race, they'd gone straight into the lead. And the fossil record shows that they were set to stay on top for another 50 million years. If we were ever going to rise to dominance, something would have to break the super snail's grip on power. Four hundred and forty million years ago, suddenly, and quite literally out of the blue, we got lucky. It's ironic, but the thing that ultimately came to save us nearly killed us in the process a vast and overwhelming natural disaster struck the Earth. Just a few miles from the Sum Shale, Hannes Tron has taken Simon to see a section of bare rock which looks like a plowed field. But it's evidence, Hannes believes, for a global catastrophe, a mega ice age. We have the glacial floor here. Some agent must have created these deep indentations, gouges and striations. So in the process of moving across this partly consolidated soft sort of sediment still, it made scratches and it made... And anything, however big or small, was fair game. Once spotted in the open, the chances of escape for this solitary Olenoides were zero. Overwhelming size and power put a swift end to the chase. And the hard jaws and vice-like claws would make short work of dismembering the armored bug. Des has found startling evidence to show quite how big these monsters could get. We have this specimen here, and you can see the, uh, the huge claws of these are almost a foot long. So you're talking about animals probably up to four or five feet, four or five feet long. So it's much bigger than everything else in the Burgess Shale. This was the, the major predatory group 
in the Cambrian period half, half a billion years ago, the first major predatory group on Earth. Hunting in the oceans today follows the same strategies invented half a billion years ago by these animals. Stalking, evasion, camouflage and surprise attack all started here. And the pioneers all belong to one group. Biological experiment, he will apply the same evolutionary forces that produced us to create a new life form, an alien on Earth. He's starting with a bug that first appeared 300 million years ago, an aggressive, highly organized predator, the common wasp. We're going to need to scale it up. Is that possible? Though limited by its body armor, Simon believes that with a bit of added support, a six-legged bug could stand as big as a wolf. Add the body back up. Add the original body. Now evolution would take it in the same direction as the human race. It would stand upright. The advantages of height and reach would change its body shape, allowing it to stand as tall as a man. And freeing up the forearms would allow the evolution of a hand. Three, three things coming together in the form of a right. triangle. Yeah. So if you can elongate the head slightly, yeah. like um, the alien in the film, okay, yeah. series of films. And with a large head, Simon's creature is ready to take the final evolutionary leap. This may have given the organism the possibility to evolve a larger brain. So it's reasonable to expect that it also would have been evolving intelligence. Wow. And just when things were starting to look up. 80 million years of evolution since the Burgess Shale had put us in a position to overtake the bugs, only to find that we'd been overtaken by the snails. These super snails had not only joined the arms race, they'd gone straight into the lead. And the fossil record shows that they were set to stay on top for another 50 million years. If we were ever going to rise to dominance, something would have to break the super snail's grip on power. Four hundred and forty million years ago, suddenly, and quite literally out of the blue, we got lucky. It's ironic, but the thing that ultimately came to save us nearly killed us in the process. A vast and overwhelming natural disaster struck the Earth. Just a few miles from the Sum Shale, Hannes Tron has taken Simon to see a section of bare rock which looks like a plowed field. But it's evidence, Hannes believes, for a global catastrophe, a mega ice age. We have the glacial floor here, some agent. A major fossil bed was unearthed here, called the Sum Shale. And just like the Burgess Shale 80 million years previously, it held a complete snapshot of life on Earth. Simon Brady has come to South Africa to see the evidence for the next stage in the evolutionary arms race. He is joined by geologist Hannes Tron, who made the single most important discovery here. Teeth, some of the earliest on Earth, our first weapons in the war for world domination. They belong to an animal called a conodont, a descendant of Bacaya. At 15 inches, the conodonts were 10 times bigger than their feeble ancestor. And with their new armory, they could finally stand up to their old enemy, the arthropods. It seemed the evolutionary tables had turned, or had they? Because this bug wasn't killed by a conodont. The conodonts don't represent actual true predators, they're scavengers, so they, they feed on dead carcasses of animals which are just littering around in the environment. So the vertebrates haven't made that breakthrough yet in the evolutionary arms race of becoming predators. 
So if we weren't doing the of digging up every pacaya hiding in the sea floor. Des Collins and his assistant, Kevin Goslin, are taking a trip to a remote plateau high in the Rockies in search of this elusive predator. So far, they have found only jaws and claws, no complete body. But the evidence points to a monster as big as Anomalocaris and with a definite taste for the lowlife. If something was going to find Pacaya in his hiding place, the fossils suggest this mysterious predator could have done it. We've been here on, on previous trips, and on that we found these claws and the jaws of a new Dinocarid. We, uh, we know it's new because the, the claws them, themselves have these long, thin spines running from them. So our understanding of this is that these would work together. And the only reason I can see for something like that is that they use them to rake through, this, through the mud on the bottom. So I would say this animal uh, was probably feeding on soft-bodied forms rather than feeding on something with a hard exoskeleton on it. Rather than chase other hard-cased megabugs, this guy specifically went after softer targets in the seabed, like buried pacayas. The evolutionary tables had turned full circle. The sea scorpions have developed of these gigantic sizes, and the arthropods have come back as the one, and they're contending, and they're in the, in the form of this guy would have would, would have nothing would have, would attack something like this. The bugs were once more king of the seas. And at this moment in time, 400 million years ago, it looked like they were bound to win the war. Yet they would soon be defeated for good, and we would be victorious at last. But why? Because within every vertebrate lies a secret weapon, and every arthropod has a major hidden flaw but they would only come to light in the final evolutionary battle fought on a new battlefield, the land. Ironically, the seeds of our triumph and the arthropods' downfall were planted in the oceans half a billion years ago at the time of the Burgess Shale. Eager at that time to expand their empire and being the only group able to do it, the bugs took an inevitable but fatal step. While the arms race raged in the oceans, the first bug, the apocalypse that removed the dinosaurs, but many times bigger. A quarter of all life died in this icy holocaust. Our survival hung in the balance. Any mass extinction can be thought of as when life was on a knife edge. It's a critical moment where the course of evolution could be changed. And depending on how organisms cope with that mass extinction, how they're able to adapt and diversify after that extinction will drive the course of subsequent evolution for 50, 100 million years. The evolutionary arms race was turned on its head. The big losers were the mollusks. 80% of nautiloids disappeared, while the bugs got off lightly. And we just about hung on. It raises a critical question. If a global catastrophe hits every animal on Earth, why do some survive when most perish? How did we manage to escape the big freeze? The answer could lie here, in an ancient forest near Cape Town. There's a piece of living evidence that may help explain how we survived this natural disaster. In the Newlands Forest lives a crew. Without sunlight, the plants died. The food chain was broken. Starvation set in. And when the big thaw came, things got even worse. Melting fresh water polluted the sea, poisoning the marine animals. It was a mass extinction, like the apocalypse that removed the dinosaurs, but many times bigger. 
A quarter of all life died in this icy holocaust. Our survival hung in the balance. Any mass extinction can be thought of as when life was on a knife edge. It's a critical moment where the course of evolution could be changed and depending on how organisms cope with that mass extinction, how they're able to adapt and diversify after that extinction will drive the course of subsequent evolution for 50, 100 million years. The evolutionary arms race was turned on its head. The big losers were the mollusks. 80% of nautiloids disappeared, while the bugs got off lightly. And we just about hung on. It raises a critical question. If a global catastrophe hits every animal on Earth, why do some survive when most perish? 150 feet down on the sea floor was where most creatures lived among forests of sponges. Scuttling bottom feeders went in search of a mating partner while trying to avoid becoming someone else's lunch. Everything here was wary of intruders and each had its own way of dealing with threats. Above cruised packs of opportunist hunters ready to use their whipped tentacles on the unwary. This pin cushion on legs used its spines to prevent attack from above but there were dangers in the strangest places and the weirdest forms. This five-eyed paddled steamer carried a vicious mouth at the end of an elephant-like trunk, a search and destroy feeder all in one. These freakish creatures may seem very alien, yet they are not sci-fi inventions, and this is not an alien planet. This is planet Earth, half a billion years ago. And this period of Earth's history, the Cambrian era, saw the evolution of the world's first complex animals. Amazingly, they appeared almost overnight in a sudden burst of evolution, what scientists have labeled the Cambrian explosion. Though our ancestors were on the run and the threat of extinction was just around the corner, Sooner or later, they were destined to fight back. And the reign of the bugs would eventually give way. But it wasn't our family, the vertebrates, who next rose to power. There was a new terror lurking in the seas. The age of the super snails was about to begin. Having narrowly avoided annihilation at the hands of the megabugs, it was the turn of the super snails to put us under sentence of death. The second great battle would prove to be the toughest fight of our evolutionary lives. The new campaign began 440 million years ago. The evidence for it is buried here in South Africa, in a layer of rock that starts at the top of Cape Town's Table Mountain and stretches 100 miles inland. A major fossil bed was unearthed here, called the Sum Shale. And just like the Burgess Shale 80 million years previously, it held a complete snapshot of life on Earth. First plants appeared, building up the planet's ozone layer. In this cooler world with its natural sunblock, creatures no longer needed a spacesuit to survive. 370 million years ago, the first vertebrates left the seas and came onto land. They brought with them a secret weapon that would change the balance of power forever. That weapon was our internal skeleton, a simple but highly effective framework it allowed us to build bodies of overwhelming size and power. We could totally outgrow our armor-bound bug competitors. And in the arms race, more than anywhere, size mattered. For the bugs, there was nowhere to go but down, which meant 
downsizing. The insects, millipedes, spiders, and lobsters all went through a process of miniaturization. For those who refuse to follow, the end of the line lies here, in the remote Cedarburg Mountains of South Africa. Two years ago, Cape Town geologist John Almond unearthed a bizarre set of footprints on one of these giant shale boulders.